Hey, we're now going to look at digital certificates and digital signatures. So this is just a straight follow on from my video on asymmetric encryption. So make sure you've watched that or at least familiar with the concept of asymmetric encryption before you watch this. So in asymmetric encryption, the entity that's wanting people to encrypt their messages to them publishes a public key which is available to anyone and people use that to encrypt their communications to this entity, this person or business or organization, whoever it is. And a certificate gives us proof of ownership of a public key. A public key is just a very, very long number. It doesn't tell us who it belongs to automatically. We need to associate it with the entity via a certificate. So a certificate is like a ID for the entity and it's used to prove their identity, like a passport is used to prove we are who we say we are when we go into another country. It's the same idea with certificates. Certificates are issued by certificate authorities, CAs, which are businesses whose whole job it is to essentially associate entities with a public key, they need to verify that the entity is who they say they are and also that they own this public key. And so there is an element of trust here. If we see a certificate has come from this business, we're trusting them that they have um, in fact verified this person to the, the high enough standard. And this, this is true for passports as well. When you go to another country, they look at the passport, we see it was issued by this government and they're trusting that government, they're trusting that government to have given a passport to the correct person. In order to show that this authority has approved the certificate, the authority will sign it digitally. So the actual certificate will have two sections. We'll have a data section and a signature section. Signature where this is the unique signature from the authority, so it can be checked. Uh, but the data section will have details about the entity. It will have details about the authority when it expires, the algorithm used to the algorithm that's going to be used for this encryption, and the public key itself. So let's have a look at an actual example of this. Most web browsers allow you to see the certificates quite easily. I'm on the homepage of the BBC and on Chrome, just left of the URL, you can view the certificate if it has one. So this has been shown to be valid. Google Chrome has checked for signature and has found out that it's from a trusted authority, Global Sign, and it's it's still valid. It will expire in 2019 uh, and then they'll renew it, hopefully. So it shows you the algorithms used to find the signature and also it will show you the BBC's public key. Anyone can view public key, it's not very dangerous, it's a, it's a private key you don't want to be sharing. So you can view the public key here um, and all sorts of information about the BBC and um, the algorithms they're using to encrypt the data. Let's just focus on the signature section then because this is, they're used in certificates quite clearly but they're not, part, they're not they're a separate concept essentially but it's just used in this case. So they also use asymmetric encryption and the general process, and this may vary a little bit, if you've learned something slightly different, that's okay. But the general idea is they are sent alongside a message. So in this case, the message is for certificate, but it could just be a, a generic message and we append a signature onto it. So what will happen is the message itself will have a value calculated from it, like a hash value or a checksum, just some value that's calculated from it that is as unique to that message as possible. And then we will encrypt this value using the private key of this person who wants to sign it. So we take a message, we calculate some value from it that's as unique as possible, and then further encrypt it using our private key. This value produced is the signature and it's sent alongside the message. And then when the message is received, it's decrypted using the sender's public key. Because we have this key pair, only the public key can decrypt it because it's been encrypted by the private key. It will then recalculate the hash to see if it matches this value. So it will have the signature that's been decrypted and we've got that hash value and also it will recalculate it on the message to see if it matches the value. So this will give us three really important characteristics. The first one being authentication, probably the most important. The fact that we can decrypt it shows that we have at least some association with this entity. If we frame it within the bank example again, which we use a lot, if we're getting a message from our bank and the bank is appending a signature to it, we have access to the bank's, pri the bank's public key and if we try to decrypt the message using the bank's public key and it didn't work, then it shows that it's being encrypted by another person, someone we don't want to deal with. It's, it's a separate person, it's someone who can't be trusted. A second really useful property of this process is that the signature itself helps us determine the integrity of a message, i.e. whether the message has been altered from being sent to being received, because you can still alter encrypted messages. So. We, this recalculation here of the hash is to check whether the message has been altered mid-transit. The whole concept of a hashing algorithm is you run it on a message and every time you run that 
algorithm on the same message, you get the same hash value produced. If a message is slightly different, if you change a few characters around or add some information to it, you'll get a completely different hash value. And so when we recalculate it, we're checking to see if we actually do get the same one as that came on the signature. If it's different, then it's been altered mid-transit and we want to discard it. A third crucial characteristic is non-repudiation. This is about not being able to deny that you've sent the message. You don't want someone to turn around and say, oh, that wasn't me, that wasn't my signature. Well, if the private key is kept secret, only that sender could have sent it. Unless the private key is leaked somehow, which is a huge data breach, only that person could have sent it. Because we've got the matching public key, only that public key will correspond to the private key. So that private key is linked to the public key. If we've decrypted it, then only that person could have sent the message. So a digital signature is part of a certificate. The certificate in this case is the message. So they'll compile all this data, they'll put it all together, and then find the hash, encrypt it, and send it um, alongside, the, alongside the certificate in a separate section. So uh, this is the message in that context. We do have digital signatures used in other places, often in, in place of written signatures. So recently I moved house and my contract, I signed it using an online digital signature provider, which is obviously a lot more secure than my real signature, which could be forged in theory. So they are being used more frequently, not just in certificates. Just to try and summarize these four steps then, if you are an entity which has a public and a private key, and you want to be able to distribute the public key to your customers, you will apply to a certificate authority and pay them some money and have your public key and identity verified. The certificate authority will create a certificate for them. It will have a date range, it will have other information on it about the entity itself. And then they'll sign that certificate to prove that they have in fact approved it. This is obviously not the simplest of processes, but it's really important because if a person used a public key without verifying who it came from, who belong, who the key belongs to, they could be inadvertently sending data to an attacker. So if you're meant to be communicating with your bank, to use my favorite example, and a hacker had somehow tricked you into believing they were in fact the bank, maybe with a phishing website, they could send their public key to you and then you could use the public key to encrypt data and send it to them instead. If you used a certificate instead, you could verify that the certificate is in fact fake, then of course you wouldn't send the data to them. Anybody can create a certificate. I could create one for Google or for Facebook and put my own public key on it. But no browser is going to accept that certificate. They're not going to let you go on that website. Some browsers will just not let you go on a website unless it's got a valid certificate which has been signed by a trusted certificate authority.